Hey, this is Will Swartstrom. This is Stefan Bolt. Hey guys, this is Ernie Howard. This is M.A. Phipps, and you're listening to 30, 30, 30, 30 Minute Author Interviews with Preston Lay. Woohoo! Welcome, everybody, to this episode of 30 Minute Author Interviews. Our guest today is Eamon Ambrose. Thank you for taking time out of your day and joining us today, Eamon. Thanks for having me, Preston. We've started something new here at the uh, podcast, starting out, the, uh, starting out each interview with uh, two truths and a lie. So if you could, can you give me two truths and a lie about you and let me try to awfully guess at which one I think is the lie? Uh, I can. Uh, right. Okay, I've picked three things here. So uh, one is that I used to own a Ferrari. Okay. Okay. The other one is that uh, I've met Leonard Nimoy. Okay. And the other one is that I used to work for Apple, putting the apples on the front of their computers. Okay. Um, it's kind of tough. <laughs> <laughs> I suck. I let you. Game. I let you too. Um, let's see. Man, that'd be so cool if you you really did met. Oh man, owning a Ferrari would be kind of cool too. I'm gonna go with number three about putting the apples on their products is the lie. And actually, that's true. Is it really? <laughs> I, I, a company. I used to work for a company years ago. Uh, and they outsourced part of the the manufacturing of um, an Apple, I think it's a power PC. Okay. Back in the, the mid nineties, and uh, <laughs> I got stuck with this job of basically the getting the the Apple the Apple logo. It was on like a little plastic background, okay. so I had to pick it up with my with my thumb and press it into the into the space on the front of the the thing. So basically, <laughs> I had to do thousands of these a day. <laughs> They didn't have they didn't have any machines to do it, uh, so basically I have I had the thumbprint of an apple on my uh, the print of an apple on my thumb for about six months afterwards. <laughs> that is from fun. pushing all these things in. <laughs> wow, that's uh, that's interesting. So <laughs> so for the for the listeners, which one was the lie? Uh, the lie was the one about the Ferrari. Oh. I've, I've never I've had an MG. That's about it. Oh really? <laughs> uh, and I have I have met Leonard Nimoy. That was that was an amazing experience. <laughs> so, can you tell us the story behind meeting uh, Leonard uh, Nimoy? Um, I was actually it was in London. Uh, well, I was a, a good few years ago now. I think it was probably late nineties. I think no, it wasn't. It was later. It was later than that. It was kind of I think it was around mid two thousand six. I think two thousand seven. Um, I was in London at a, in a hotel. <laughs> Uh, and there was a convention on in in the, uh, an event center next door, and um, I just basically I, I I got into the lift um, and the doors opened and he was standing there, so uh, I was kind of starstruck and <laughs> I, I just said I said I have to say it all to him at least, um, so I did and he he we had a brief conversation but he he was actually one of the nicest people I've ever met he was just so gentleman and he was very you know very enthusiastic and he want you know he didn't he wanted to talk to me he was you know there was no star sort of air about him he was just really really nice um, and he, he he signed a photo for me and we said went down away just for a couple of minutes but it was it was a lovely experience uh just to, you know to be standing anywhere near it uh but it, it was it was fantastic that is awesome He's just, but he was just, he was just, it just struck me about how nice he was. He wasn't, you know, he was a really nice guy. So, so he was pretty down to earth about everything. Absolutely. Yeah. That is awesome. Well, for those that might not know uh, who you are, or what you do, can you kind of just do a brief intro for our listeners on who you are and what you do? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm Eamon Ambrose and I'm from Limerick in Ireland. Um, and I write. Well, my first book um, is called Zero Hour, and it's a post-apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic fiction, uh, which originally sp- sprang from a, a short story that I published just over a year ago, and um, it became 
so popular that people wanted to hear more uh, of the characters in the story. So I decided to continue it and that's now finished and it has just been released as a, as a full novel and um, with the print version available very soon, hopefully. Um, and I've got some other projects coming up as well, so which, are, which I'm excited about. So uh, that's basically my, my bag at the moment. Um, I have a day job, which is kind of boring, so I, I don't even want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> that works. <laughs> yeah, I I only bore everybody else as well. Um, but it's it, yeah, I I I'm I kind of fell into writing. I used to be a blogger. Um, I used to review books. Uh, I still do a little bit, and I kind of got into writing from that, from talking to other, meeting other authors and speaking to them and seeing how they sold their work and how they were surviving as as indie authors and, and how they uh, this, the whole publishing system works. So it kind of got me very interested in it, and I, I was I had toyed around with writing my own stuff for a long time, um, but eventually I, I did. I just sat down, sat down, did it, and and wrote the the story that became Zero Hour, and um, it it all sort of took off from there, really. So, how was that transition from blogging to writing? Was it fairly easy, or was it uh, were there a lot of challenges that you had to overcome? Um, it was pretty easy, I think. I, uh, the thing about the, the blogging is it, it's a good um, it's good practice if you want to be an author because you have to. Um, it, it's more, especially if you're reviewing, especially it's it's tough because you, you have to sort of find ways of saying the same thing over and over again. You know, <laughs> because you can't say it, even if you enjoy the book, you, you can't say the same sort of thing every time you know a good characters or a, a good plot structure you, you kind of have to be careful that you're not repeating yourself in, in in the review so you kind of have to find different ways of saying stuff which is good and it's good practice if you want to be a writer i think um so i, I found it i find it pretty easy i actually find it harder out going back and reviewing oh than really I, I do than i do writing actually making something up um <laughs> uh, because I, I find it, it, it's just so restricting now when you go back to it that you, you know, that, that I've been writing sort of fiction for a while, and it's it's kind of tough going back. And I I, I still try and do um, maybe one or two reviews a month if I can. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been listening to a lot more audio books lately, so I might I think I might start reviewing some of those as well. Um, but yeah, it's 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 good practice. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So, where did your inspiration for your zero hour come from? What what inspired that story? Um, a couple of things. I, I, obviously, I love science fiction, um, but one of the, the the kind of prevalence of AI and robotics in the last couple of years, and that there's been a, a kind of a shift in the paradigm where it's, things are changing a lot now very quickly, and we're moving ahead. Uh, towards more sorry human orientated devices and AI and, and stuff like that and I think it was probably watching the the movie uh, Ex Machina um, that shift between the human and, and the interaction between the humans and, and the robots uh, was so well done in that movie and it made me think a lot about certain aspects of robotics and AI and how how they would would interact with with other people. Um, so, but I I still wanted to do a different twist on it. Um, so I did it sort of without giving away too much. Right. You know, I, I wanted to change the way people perceive a book, you know a, a kind of genre book like that when they read it. So I deliberately made some changes to to, to that story to make people look back at the end and say, well, I didn't really read it that way originally. <laughs> but this, you know, these certain things that happened towards the end would make you go back and think about what you'd already read and and see that you'd read it in a certain frame of mind uh, with certain perceptions mm-hmm. and certain preconceptions. So I, I think a lot of people got that ending, which is good. So it it, it was nice to do do something that was a bit twisty and had a bit of a change to it. And uh, as well as that, the the tense was, it was second person, which isn't really often done that often. Uh, and it gives a sort of more immersive experience when you're reading. 
Um, so again, that was something that I kind of added to it to to make it stand out a little more. Uh, would, that could have gone badly <laughs> right. as well as as well because some people don't like it and it, that that's fine if they don't. Um, but generally, the, the response has been really really good. I've only had a, a handful of people that said they didn't like it, and a lot of people said that. that they didn't like it originally, but once they got into the story, that you know they got more comfortable with it. So I kind of kept it out. I, I, I had I had dis- probably decided not to keep going with that for the rest of the story, but I ended up doing that anyway because it just didn't fit. Otherwise, it just didn't. I didn't want the first story to be completely different to the rest. I wanted to sort of be a, you know have a better flow and be more of a, have a, a good continuity. So I, I decided to stick with it for for, for most of it anyway. So as you said, Zero Hour was originally just released as kind of a you know a part one, just a short story. Um, yeah, you- it, was, it was just a stand a standalone. There was there, you know I hadn't planned on doing anything else. I, when my original plan was I was going to write a couple of short stories, release them, um, and then eventually put them in an, an anthology um, and to put those out while I was doing my my first novel. Um, but. I had originally sort of planned it that way, <laughs> but uh, because it started getting popular, I sat down then and, and decided to, to continue it. What was it hard for you to continue um, since you hadn't planned out anything past the original short story? Was it hard to draw it out into uh, six parts into a novel? Not really. I, it was easier easier than I thought. It, it took a while. It took longer than I thought, but I, I didn't find it that particularly hard. I think it, it took longer because I, I really don't get that much time to write. But so, um, and I, I kind of I'm a very slow writer as well. But yeah, I, it, I didn't find it that hard. No, uh, it was it was pretty easy actually. But the thing is, the way I wrote the story, um, I didn't really plan it out that much. Uh, I kind of wrote. What we it's what we call pantsing. <laughs> so by the seat by the senior pants. So I for every part I wrote, I just wrote, basically sat down and wrote. I didn't plan anything. Everything just happened as as I wrote it. So you know there was no real. I had sort of a basic middle and an ending, but even that that was I that changed slightly towards the end as well. So yeah, I was okay. I think we I think I, I got away with it. <laughs> Uh, before we continue talking about Zero Hour, can you kind of give the listeners who haven't heard about it the little non-spoiler book blurb on what Zero Hour is actually about? Yeah, um, well, the the basic story is that it's about a soldier who, who wakes up after an attack. Um, most of the world has already has been just pretty much destroyed most most of the population are gone um, and they're sort of the last one of the last groups of people left they were fighting against what look, seems to be a, a, a robotic robotic uprising um, and this person wakes up and, and and thinks that they're all that's left so they decide to go to um, what's called the tower which is where everything sort of came from and where everything was controlled from so it's just basically all that's left is this tower that controls and everything and watches over everything uh so they decide to go there and try to find some answers but things change on the way and things change when they get there and um everything just all is not as it seems basically there's a lot of twists and, and turns in the story so uh, as you said, Zero Hour was written in second person. Um, what was the most challenging thing for you when writing in second person? And then how did you overcome the challenges? Um, I think with the thing with second person is that um, you need to be very descriptive uh, from a visual point of view. You need to be able to dis- to sort of immerse that person in whatever scene that you're writing they need to sort of feel like they're there uh and that may seem like what people do normally with 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 fiction but with second person you're 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 speaking to them so you're trying to to make them think that you know that they're in this place um so it's a little harder but i i I think the easiest way to do it is you need to be descriptive but at the same time at the same time you don't want to be saying you, you, you all the time. Mm-hmm. So you, you, it needs to have a little bit of a flow to it. Um, and they need to sort of uh, be able to 
use their own imagination to a certain point as well. So it's a fine line. It's 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 not an easy thing to write in. Um, but again, uh, especially for the more sort of action action scenes, mm-hmm. they they are the ones that you really need to work on because it's it's fine to describe a place or you know or, or a person or a location, but when you're doing an action scene and there's a lot of action scenes in in zero or um these they really have to to be concise and exact and they, you know people need to know exactly what's happening and, you know what blow is hitting where what explosion is exploding where you know they need to know where everything is so it's it, it it's difficult but it's it's kind of fun too i, I enjoy writing in it I, I i probably won't do it again for a while <laughs> uh but I, I may come back to it at some point uh, but for the next one, I'm just going going with plain tenses. <laughs> there we go. Um, so, why did you decide to write a zero hour in second person? Um, I think I, well, I'd read a couple of books that were in second person, and uh, it seemed like it, I didn't do it. I actually didn't do it deliberately. Uh, I think I I just sat down, and it was kind of the first line they came out with. The, with the first line is "You wake." And I kind of went from there, um, and I hadn't realised I was even doing it until I was probably a couple of a chapter into it, even. And then I stepped back, I, I kind of read it back, and I was going, oh, "Hang on a second, this is I've just written it in second tense without, you know, without even thinking about." It. <laughs> um, so I just ran, I just ran with it. I said, "Okay, let, let's see what happens. Let's see where it goes." Because it was a short story, I had nothing to lose. I hadn't planned on even releasing it at that stage. I don't think. Um, so I just went with it and it worked. Um, and when, when you wrote this, did you always plan on publishing it, uh, indie or did you ever, uh, think that you might try to shop it out and go the traditional route? Um, not originally because it it was only at the start, it was just a short story. So, uh, I didn't even know if I was going to be able to finish it, if, if there was anything else. Um, but I, well, I think eventually, if I once I realized it was going to be a full novel, uh, it was probably something I, I would have considered. But because it took me a year or so to write it, um, you know, it's it's not something I, I kind of thought about, to be honest. I was happy because because I'd start publishing from day one. Um, I was more worried with, about getting the other parts finished and getting those out. So it wasn't really an option at that point. So, but with it finished, who knows? I mean, it's, it's the option is there. Um, but for now, I just want to get it, get it out there and get people to read it. Cause the problem is now that I've, I'm sort of starting from scratch again, because with releasing the, the, the full, not the omnibus version, a lot of people now don't know it. So I have to sell the whole thing as a, as a package. Right. Um, I mean, anyone that's read the other the other six parts already aren't going to. Uh, would expect them to buy it certainly anyway. Uh, unless they might want to, might might want to buy a print version. But I need to get new readers now. And the thing is, I have I have like I have to start all over again with reviews and stuff like that because it's a separate book. Even though zero or part one has been hidden, it's almost at a hundred reviews now, which is brilliant. Right. Uh, so, but with with the the omnibus version now, I just have to start from scratch. So I have to get, I have to go back now and get people to review it and get more reviews in. So that's tr- that's tough as well. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, especially now it's, it's getting harder and harder to get reviews. Yeah. I've even noticed recently, I, I always kind of had a steady trickle of reviews coming in a couple of weeks um, for the last couple of months. But I, for the last four or five weeks, I've, I've seen nothing coming in on most of the books that I have already. So I don't know what's ha- Is it something that's happening with Amazon or something like that? But it, there's, there's certainly something weird happening there at the moment. Right. Um, so why do you think Zero Hour blew up the way it did? Because it became kind of a really big hit in the indie community. I, t- I don't know. I, th- I don't know if it was a combination of the, the second tense stuff, second person, second person stuff, uh, or the style of writing or just the story. I think uh, I, I was kind of amazed with some of the reaction at the start. That it was just people who were just so enthusiastic about it. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of probably thinking a lot of it's down to the, the sort of the, the, 
the intensity of the story. It's a very intense story from the start, and it, it doesn't really let up until the end. You know, it's it's the, there is very little lull in the story, um, and I think it, it it it's very much an action story, and I think people like that. Uh, I think I think part of the the way the way that I wrote is is because I I have a terrible attention span, <laughs> so it, if if you can if your book can grab my attention, um, you're doing pretty well. Um, so I think that probably helped a little bit because I I kind of wrote it in a very in that in that sort of way, uh, whereas yeah I wanted to keep people's attention as as much as I could throughout. So I think that's probably why it, it, if if people liked it and reviewed it well, that's probably why. I think I, I, some of it, another part of it as well was I think a lot of it was curiosity because a lot of people in in the industry sort of knew me already from from either the book blogging or just just from being friends with other authors. So I think a lot was curiosity as well. Um, so I, I remember going on the early days, going onto keyboards and stuff like that, and people going, "Who's this guy? He's got you know." He's got, he's got a book out. He's got a, a blur from from Huawei on the front. And nobody gets that, you know. And uh, so I think a lot of it was that sort of curiosity of who the hell is this, is this guy, and then they read the book and they think, wow, this is pretty good. So, you know, uh, it was a win win for me in that case. Um, but yeah, it's I think it's mostly that it's there's a couple, probably different factors. Some of I was obviously just playing luck as well. Um, but sometimes, sometimes just things work out for the better. In, in that case, it certainly did. Yeah, and as you said before, you were writing. You did a um, a blog. So, have you been reading um, your whole entire life, or was that something you picked up kind of later on? I, I, I'll be honest. I I was when I was younger, um, in my kind of early teens and up to my early twenties, I was a really, really voracious reader. I read everything. Uh, I was a huge horror fan. Um, I was basically raised by Stephen King and Anne Rice, um, and uh, I love the I love Tolkien. I love Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, all the, all that stuff. Um, and then when I kind of hit my early twenties, I, I, I lost track of it and I, I kind of stopped reading for a long time because uh, I, I was in I got into music, so I was in the music business for a while. And then when I got a little bit older and I started to settle down, um. I, I kind of got back into it in probably in my mid to late thirties, I think, and but I still hadn't really pushed it. Uh, I had I kind of got interested, but I didn't really go back into it. But then when the Kindle uh, when the Kindle arrived, um, I'd actually bought one for my wife because uh, she she loves to read. And she goes through so many books. I thought this would be a good idea for her. Mm-hmm. And this was at the early, the early days of the Kindle. This was the, the Kindle keyboard one. And I bought, I bought it for Christmas, and I gave it to her on Christmas morning. And she was, she was working that day, but I gave it to her before she left. And she, goes, she just looked at me and goes, "What the hell is this?" <laughs> And <laughs> okay, I, I just said, "Don't worry, I'll explain later. Just go to work, and I'll explain when you get home." <laughs> so. I got home. She got home later, and I, I, had, I had it full of books uh, for her that I knew she probably like, and uh, I showed her how to use it. And she sat down, still kind of bemused and angry. <laughs> but about an hour later, she was flicking through it, and she hasn't left it out of her hand since. <laughs> it's her. She, you know, and she loves it. And. I then I saw okay well this thing me you know this there's something about this device then so I decided to get one myself then uh, a couple of months later and and it went from there and that's when I started it was a friend of mine um who's a who's a a, a radio presenter uh, he he's and he loves he's a big reader as well and um and then he re- recommended when I, when I bought the Kindle, I said, okay, recommend me some books, uh, sci-fi books. I like sci-fi. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he recommended Wool to me. And uh, it basically went from there. So once I started reading Wool, uh, I was hooked again at reading. And it just I, then from that, I, I got into reading all the other stuff. Um, and then but I, but the thing was, when it, I, I ended up reading a lot of indie stuff then because then I started doing the blog. And it changed it changed for me there because I, 
because you're reviewing so many books, you end up reading a lot of books from the same people and in, you end up in the same circles. So, mm-hmm. but I, I kind of try to mix it up a little bit and do, do some other stuff as well. So I, I, did, I wrote for a couple of websites and, um, did some reviews for them as well. And, um, it kind of sprung from there then. So that's, that was sort of the timeline for it was just from, from wool onwards, really. So wool sucked you down the rabbit hole, huh? <laughs> yeah. I'm sure uh, there's an awful lot of people that, that you interview will, will say the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of the circle of friends that we have, it, it, there's, it, they, they all have the same sort of story. It was that, that was the inspiration for a lot of people. I think. Yeah. It's, it, it's amazing how many people find out about indie publishing through Hugh Howey, and or yeah. and or his wool story because for me that's how I discovered it. Um, I found wool and Target. Uh, we we'd always go by the book section and there was wool on the end cap of the book section. I was like, "Huh, what's this book about?" So I bought it and then researched Hugh Howey and then from Hugh Howey I discovered Jason Gurley and Michael Bunker and then it's just you're down the rabbit hole from there. <laughs> Yeah, I think every, a lot of people went the same way. Yeah. I, I think uh, the thing is that, um, I, yeah, and I like you, I I wasn't part of the the, the Wolf phenomenon before it was published uh, in print, so I, I hadn't. You know, it was a different, a much different story when that came out. So that was the first kind of serialized, it's the first time I'd seen a serial as well, which which was interesting to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when he when he released Sand. Um, in the same form uh, and Beacon 23 later, you know, I, I'd seen that as a serial. That was kind of part of the inspiration to continue the Aurora as a serial as well, because I'd seen how it was done and I'd, I'd read out, I'd seen how he'd, he'd done it. And it, it, it was a big help to me when I was trying to figure out what to do and how to write zero or as a serial. Uh, that was a, a, a big influence as well. I haven't read Beacon 23 yet, but um, yeah, it's, it's really is it really? Um, yeah. Sand has got to be one of my favorites by Hugh Howie. I think I'd even put it above wool. I love Sand. Yeah. I was just drawn into the world. It was just a, an amazing story. Yeah, it was brilliant. I, I really liked it as well. Yeah. Um, so... What have you learned over your time um, while writing Zero Hour that has made you become a better writer? Um, I think I've, I've learned to, to discipline myself a little bit more. Um, I think the important thing, if you want to be a writer, um, uh, I'm no expert at this stage even, uh, but you need to you need to have uh, you need to write as as little and as often as you can, I think it works for me anyway. I I, I write um, most. I do most of my writing actually on my lunch break um, when, I, when I'm at work. So Monday to Friday, for an hour, I do most of my I do most of my writing. Probably ninety percent of it. I do a little bit at the weekend if I get time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have three kids and have a day job, so you know it's pretty busy. Um, but I think if you can, if you can, if you can make yourself sit down for an hour a day and just write as you don't, you don't, the thing is, I think a lot of people get hung up on, on, on word counts and writing so much every day. You don't need to do that. You just need to write. If you write a little bit every day, it all adds up. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you see people on, on putting up posts every day. Well, I've written 10,000 words today. I've written 5,000 words today. It doesn't matter. Uh, because if, if, for all you know, 4,999 4, of those words would be crap. You don't know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> Your editor's going to get rid it of means, most it of those. Means, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it means nothing. Uh, so write little and often is good for me. So if you can sit down and, and make it a habit, I think, if you see, if you can make it a habit, that you have to sit down every for an hour every day, because I think because I do it on my lunch break as well. It's it's I kind of I, I get really I really I kind of look forward to it, mm-hmm. sitting down for that hour and and just belt. It. I, I sit in my car and, and write for an hour. That's it. So so how much of a of a chapter or uh, word words can you knock out during your lunch break? 
it varies. I mean, you, you, some days you, you might, it could only be a paragraph mm-hmm. or a couple of sentences. Other days you might nick out, you know, you might kick out 500, couple, maybe 500 words if you're lucky. But I, do, I don't stress about it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, if you're self-published, you're not really on a deadline anyway. Right, exactly. Uh, your only deadline is, you know, if, if you want to get, if you want to earn more money, you need to write more books. <laughs> right. but, um, but because I have a day job, I, I'm not, you know, it's not that much of an issue at the moment. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, some days I've, I've literally written one sentence. Other days I've, I've written, I've written an entire chapter. Um, but it, it can't, it varies a lot. You, it's, but, but the, the thing is not to worry about it too much. If you've, if you've only written a sentence, it's fine because it, you, it adds up. Uh, how many times have you been late from your lunch hour because you wanted to finish a scene that you were writing? <laughs> yeah, it, that, that's the worst part. Is that sometimes if you're you're really coming up to the end of something, you say, "Oh my god, I need to finish it." Uh, I've 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 tried. I, I I'm I hate I hate to be late for anything. So I, I I haven't really been a couple of minutes, maybe here or there. But uh, I'm having. Yeah, I I. I what I do is I just make a quick note somewhere and just of what I need to happen, and it, it, it usually works out okay. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to call. I'm having car problems. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I try not to anyway. Right. Um, so, so what can your readers expect uh, next from you? Uh, either the rest of 2016 or coming up in 2017. Um, well, I've got a couple of um, anthology things coming up. Uh, I think the first one is the I'm doing the B movie anthology uh, with Archie Cabrera, okay. uh, which is done. I think it's been it's been done through Samuel Peralta, uh, his Chronicle series. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a B just basically a B, a, a B movie horror anthology. So I'm running a story for that. Um, I think that's probably going to come out before Christmas. Okay, um, I'm not sure yet. The next one is then um, I'm writing for another uh, Chronicles. Uh, it's called the Illustrated Robot Chronicles. Okay. Uh, again, it's with Sam. I'm not sure when that's out yet. I still we still don't have a release date for that. And and then finally, I'm doing another one uh, again with Sam for um, the Hugh Howie anthology. Um, so we're all writing stories based on on wool. Um, so I'm looking forward to doing that one. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just finishing up the B the B movie one right now, mm-hmm. uh, and straight on to, straight on to the the, Hugh, <laughs> the wool one after that. <laughs> uh, so it's that'll keep me busy. I think uh, until the new year at least. Anyway, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to that illustrated robot one because I know he's been working on that one for a while. Um, yeah, that's been that's been delayed for quite a while now i think so i think he, he wants to get it right which is, which is good yeah. so i'm looking forward to that too uh, and then after that um it's it's back to my own novel then after that so um i'll, I'll probably get get to start that in the new year uh for, for the the next the next book can you give us any teasers on what your novel might be about um it, it's a lot different to zero hour uh, it's not it's not really hard sci-fi. It's more of a sort of a, a modern kind of fantasy, fantasy thing. Okay. Um, I can't really say too much about it at the moment, okay. but it's it's car it's character based. And it, it'll be based on a single character. Okay. And uh, but it it'll be it should be fairly fun. I think. Um, it it's it's a big departure from what I've done already, but it's it's actually something I'd started beforehand. Um, I I. I when zero hour started to pick up, I, I sort of dropped it for a while. I'd forgotten about it, but it was a kind of a story and it was a character that I really liked. And the way it came about was really, really strange as well. So what I, I knew I was going to come back to it at some point, but I, I, I hadn't, I didn't realize how long zero hour would take up in my life for, for the last year. Or so, uh, but I, I, I had started, I, I probably, I don't know if I had a, Five or six chapters done of, of the of the story already, um, but I still have a lot to work, a lot of work to do with the basic plot and structure and stuff like that. Um, but I think it'll be, I think it'll be, uh, it'll be a good one. Okay, well, we'll have to have you uh, definitely back on uh, when it gets closer time sure. for that release. 
Well, here at the Legendarium, we like to end each uh, podcast episode on what we call the Legendary Ending. And as you know, these are just kind of some non-book related kind of just random questions. Uh, the first one is what songs are currently on your writing playlist? Uh, I actually, I don't listen to music when I'm writing. Oh, really? Yeah. I, yeah, I, I just find it too much of a distraction oh. because I, because I think it's probably because I'm, I, I'm a musician as well. Mm-hmm. You have to, there's this thing and if you're a musician and it happens now that I'm writing as well. When you, when you, when you hear music, you automatically try to, to sort of uh, break it down and, and, and dig into it deeper and, and go into the technical side of it. So I, I tend to do that when I listen to music, so it distracts me completely. So I try not to. If I was to have something on, I'd probably just be some some soundtrack music or something like that. Right. Probably Tom, some, probably something from Thomas Newman or something like that, which I really like. I love the I love the I love the Lemony Snicket soundtrack. It's brilliant. I think you're the first person to say they don't listen to music while writing. So that's a that's a first. I I, I need quiet. I, I find it very hard. Very hard to write with any noise and distraction. <laughs> Actually, I'll, I'll lie. Bob Williams, uh, d- he doesn't listen to music. He said that he wears these big old like lawnmower looking headphones when he <laughs> writes. So he says there's a picture of him online, but I haven't seen it yet. But <laughs> so you're the second person. <laughs> That's funny. That's um, if you could pick any character from any media source, uh, comics, books, movies, video games, whatever, who would you like to be? If you were stuck in a zombie apocalypse, who would you pick? Uh, probably probably Tony Stark, I think. Okay. He, he's pretty resourceful. Even, even if he didn't have the suit, he'd still be pretty good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you had a time machine, where would you travel and why? Oh, that's a tough one. Yeah. I think I'd probably go back and, and stop Kid Rock from ever being a musician. <laughs> that would be my, that would be enough for me. <laughs> that's hilarious. No, don't do music. Do something else. <laughs> be a dentist. There we go. I didn't do anything but make music. <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> that's a first. <laughs> um, if you had one superpower, uh, what would it be and why? Oh, um... I think I'd like to. F- I think probably flying. It's it's kind of cool. Okay. Uh, I uh, I I I'm one of these people who has a lot of dreams about flying. So I and I I, I, I kind of the more I have, the better I get at it. Mm-hmm. So, so, <laughs> but it, it's always just when you get really good at it, it stops. Right. So. Exactly. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, kind of cool. And then the question we're kind of famous for here: A penguin walks through the door right now wearing a sombrero. What does he say, and why is he here? <laughs> uh, who built that wall? <laughs> there, we go. there we go. And uh, before we head out, do you have any advice, whether it be for writing or for life, that you would like to share with the, our listeners? Yeah, if you're, if, I, I get, I get asked a question. I get asked a lot is what, what kind of advice do you have for aspiring writers? Mm-hmm. And um, my answer to that is: don't be an aspiring writer. Just get out and do it. Sit down. And, and write. That's all you need to do. Uh, the, everything is there that you need now. You know, it's so easy to do. To, it's so easy to publish a book now. Mm-hmm. So just sit down and do it. Publish it. What you know? What's the worst that can happen? Exactly. I saw in one interview you did, and it might have been with Hank Garner. You said that um, one of your goals was, when writing Zero Hour was to show that you could put out. Um, uh, you could put out your own book and not have to put a lot of money into it um, in order to do yeah. it. Um, do you mind sharing with our listeners how much you ended up investing just to put out your the first part one of Zero Hour? Um, probably very little, actually. Um, I did the cover myself. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I did the formatting. I did the formatting myself. <laughs> I did some of the editing. I got it re-edited again. Um, I wasn't happy with it, so Ellen Ellen edited Ellen Campbell edited it for me. Um, and because the, the, one, the thing about doing a serial uh, or short stories that you know your your expenses aren't that high anyway because you're only getting four thousand five thousand words edited. Mm-hmm. So I think it costs something like. 
probably 40 or 50 books or something like that to get, to get it edited. Okay. Um, so that was pretty much it. Uh, I didn't do any marketing. I didn't do any advertising um, at the time. It just sort of took off itself. Um, so, it, I mean, the, the most expensive thing most of the time is, is either doing the cover or the editing. So I managed, I managed to get it pretty cheap on that. Uh, but that said, I mean, if you know, if you don't know how to design covers or you're terrible at grammar, just spend a little bit extra and, and, and do it. You know, uh, don't try and you know sit down and figure out how to, how to work Photoshop over a weekend and hope you can do it right. I mean, I had a, I've had some training in in design, so not not a huge amount, but I've had uh, I've done some courses and stuff and. Um, I actually learned a lot from from Jason Gurley as well um, because he he does some he, he did some blog posts on his website mm-hmm. um, about a design and he just a lot of tutorials and stuff like that uh, which were a great help for me uh, when I was sitting down to, to design do some design work initially um, so yeah I mean the thing is the you know it, there's a wealth a wealth of information and tutorials and everything is out there so. If you want to design your cover, you can. Um, you need a certain bit of talent, I think, to, to be able to design stuff. But mm-hmm. if you keep it simple, uh, keep everything simple. Uh, and just the, the stuff is there. Look up tutorials, look up YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, it's all out there. So, you know, if you want if you want to learn, everything is there. Um I, I kind of like to do that. I, you know, if I see something and that I can't do, and I think I might be able to do it, I'll, I'll try and learn as much about it as I can. And at least it, the resources are there now. Where it's years ago, you know, there was nothing. You know, you had to learn Photoshop on your own. It was pretty tough at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the older versions of it were, were pretty hard to use. Yeah. But now, you know, but now there's there's so many additions to it, and there's so many plugins, and there's so many other stuff that you can do yourself. It's just so much easier to use now, which is great. Yeah, and I I love how you said to just keep it simple. That's uh that's one lesson I've learned doing the blog, creating my own yeah. uh, images for uh, marketing my podcast or different posts. Um, when I create, when I was working on trying to create the podcast logo, I kept trying to do too much. Um, and it ended up being, I, I ended up paying somebody, uh, to do it and he didn't charge much for it. Um, but it's just, it's simple. And so, um, yeah, just keeping stuff, don't overthink it. Sometimes, sometimes the simpler, the better. Um, exactly. Uh, That's always been my, my, my mantra is keep it as simple as possible. I think that probably came from, from, uh, it's probably a discipline I, I took from, from the music side of things as well, because when you're doing, um, when you're writing music and, and writing songs, it's again you need to keep it simple. If you if you go too elaborate on it, it just ruins everything. So mm-hmm. it was it was one of the disciplines that I took with me. I think. Yeah. Um, well, where can our listeners go if they would like to learn more about you and your stories? Um, okay. Well, uh, you can go to my website, um, which is uh, amonambrose dot com. Um, I'm on Twitter uh, at Eamon Ambrose. And uh, I'm on Facebook. Um, I think my Facebook page is uh, Author Raymond Ambrose. So you'll find me there if you just do a search. Um, so I have a blog as well. Uh, I, I haven't been doing that much with the blog lately. I'm probably going to uh, amalgamate the whole thing onto the website and we'll see what happens there. Okay. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm easy to find. If you, it, it, it's, a, it's a name that if you Google, that there's not too many of me about. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will have... I just like... There's two other guys in the country, I think, at the moment <laughs> with the same name. That's funny. <laughs> well, we will put links to all of your uh, your website and social media and everything. Um, we'll put links to all that over at thelegendarium.com in the show notes. So if listeners want to, they can just head there and click on the links, and they'll be able to uh, find all your stuff. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you for taking time and coming on 30-Minute Author Interviews. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers. Well, guys, that's all the time we've got for this episode. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day and listening to 30-Minute Author Interviews. We hope you come back next Wednesday and every Wednesday for a brand new author interview. Head on over to Legendarium.com and check out the show notes for this episode. Eamon Ambrose has a giveaway running until Friday, November 25th, 2016. 
He's giving away a signed copy of his book, Zero Hour Part 1. So head on over there and make sure you get registered for the giveaway. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. And until next time, stay legendary. Stay legendary.